today I have the pleasure of talking to Jim Poland, uh, who really has been uh, at it from the very inception of impact investing through his work in microfinance. Uh, he's the vice president for one of the largest development agencies, which is the U.S. Uh, you know, International Development Finance Corporation. He's a vice president for uh, agriculture and healthcare, two of the, the more challenging, especially healthcare uh, in development. But Jim has a history with 30 years, what with OPIC that was formerly known as and now DFC. And really, uh, Jim was the pioneer in terms of dealing with microfinance because that was the mothership of impact investing. So welcome, Jim. I'm, it's an honor to have you here today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Asad. I've always admired your work in this space and uh, happy to uh, spend a little time with you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me just start by asking as to what circumstances led you into, you into development. Was it something that you always wanted to do or was it just serendipity that brought you into development? Well, I've been in, in this business for Oh, wow. Um, 40 plus years. I don't want to divulge uh, too much of my... Uh, <laughs> and uh, what happened back in uh, the late 70s, um, I had been through my, um, you know, my schooling and um, I was, my, my, my old man, my dad passed away and left me running some of his pharmacies. Um, which he had uh, run private independence you know, before the CVSs of this world. Yeah, There were a couple of them that were in very um, hard pressed areas of Boston, which um, I learned from him. Uh, he was a, an extremely generous type and he, we would deliver, um, you know, very uh, low cost prescriptions. And sometimes he would give them away free to, very seriously difficult places in the city. Very uh, nice. And uh, there I learned... Jim, the fruit, of, uh, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, you are right. a similar person. <laughs> so, you know, he taught me, or this situation taught me that uh, the importance of helping out um, where uh, people just... You know, if you can't afford medicine, you got some serious issues. And yeah. um, I was always very um, admired that and felt good about it. It made me feel good, right? So that was when I was in my very early twenties, and uh, I, I decided because of that, I, I, I sold those off. It wasn't my issue. It wasn't my thing. I'm not a pharmacist, and yeah. running pharmacies wasn't going to be for me. But I wanted to go to Africa. I'd always wanted to go to Africa. So I, I explored opportunities to work in Africa and I ended up with the Peace Corps. Um, yeah. So I, I signed up with them. That's a very long, difficult process, but really worth it. And they uh, originally were gonna send me to Kenya, but at that time, Kenya was really rife with corruption and I, I didn't really want that to deal with. So they gave me Botswana and um, I heard the name Botswana and immediately I go to a map because I have no idea what Botswana <laughs> is in 1980 or 1979. And uh, I learned about it and I said, yeah, I'll do this. This looks interesting. And um, that was the start of my uh, career in this business. I was a, they sent me to a very rural place, very remote place, I really should say, mm -hmm. called Maun of the Okavango Delta where I was helping uh, smallholder farmers. I was helping small businesses like, uh, you know, people who would run poultry farms or they would do yeah. their little uh, garages or uh, woodworking or metalworking that yeah. show them how to do bookkeeping, show them how to make plans, advise them on how to create uh, a loan application to get funding and to grow their businesses. And, that was an extraordinarily uh, uh, in, insightful, you know, the, 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 what I learned working in the, in the remote areas directly with businesses um, took me to the city, the capital of the country, eventually after a few years, where um, I took on some work uh, with the Botswana Development Corporation. Um, 
and this was helped along by USAID. I wasn't an employee, but uh, they helped me, you know, pay for my uh, for my life because yeah. the local salary wasn't going to do it. But there, I basically just started working as a um, you know an, an investment officer, pretty yeah. pretty you know average investment officer. But what we were put on the earth for, which I will be repeating throughout this, is to create jobs, create income, create, improve livelihoods um, of the folks in Botswana. And we did some work in the surrounding country. So I'm there uh, in Botswana uh, for many, many years. And we can get into some of the details of what I did there. Yeah, sure. But what, first question, why did you want to go to Africa? I mean, I understand you wanted to go to Africa. Was it a fascination with uh, uh, adventure or... Great question. To be honest with you, I I am a huge animal lover, right? Ah, yeah. I, if you ask me where that comes from, I don't know. But <laughs> um, to this day, I'm the same way. And I, I uh, you know, Africa, obviously, when you're that age, you think of wildlife, you think of safaris, you think of yeah. animals. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to go to the, the, a place where um, the, the there was un, a huge percentage of underserved folks that I that I could yeah. Yeah. apply this kind of need for um, working with these guys. I had this education. I had the, the fortune of being a you know middle class American who just longed to get that feeling back that I had uh, you know helping people in the in the poor areas of, of New England. Um, so those combinations and I also didn't I wasn't looking to make personal gains. So that's where the Peace Corps came in. You know, they don't pay yeah. uh, any money. It it's Kennedy who started Peace Corps, right? It was um, Kennedy, yes, and his uh, his relative, Sergeant Shriver, who started it. Shriver, yeah, right. 60 or 62, something yeah. like that. What a great uh, effort that really showcased America's best side. You oh, know, yeah. it was yeah, really, it far, still is. The Peace Corps is a fantastic program, not only to help uh, folks in these developing countries, but to bring that back. Yeah. And see a lot of folks on the Hill, a lot of politicians, a lot of people in, in power that have that experience, um, which is you know uh, extremely valuable to bring those cultures back to the States and that kind of knowledge about what it's like and, and you know why it's important um, to be involved in this world. So, you know, what you've had this at a young man, you you know, totally different uh, <laughs> environment remote in Boston, you couldn't even find on the map. But what were your learnings? What did you take from those early years that guided you through the you know, tremendous amount of work that OPIC and yourself and Lauren and Richard and uh, Michelle and other members of your team have done. What what was the 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 learnings that you took from Africa? Yeah, uh, wow, that's a huge question. I mean, yeah. specifically, um, one of the opportunities I had while I was there was was to work with some professors that came from Williams College. Um, to work with the Botswana government on developing an economic program to diversify their economy and to create jobs. And this was a grant program uh, for uh, small businesses. And I worked directly with them for about a year and a half. And that was worth to me five different PhDs. <laughs> we, 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 we analyzed the entire country, the needs of the country, the macro and microeconomics effect of this program that was put in place. And what I learned is that, uh, I mean, the learnings that I took from Africa were myriad. And one of the things was that, you know, these people that were helping people think about Africa, they think about starving people who have no education and no ability and no, and no yeah. hope, right? No hope. And in order to, grow an economy of uh, educated people who can contribute and grow, you need to instill hope, right? 
Because if you think about it, if really think about it, if you don't have hope for the future, there's no future. Because people will just del delve into crime and to all kinds of horrible activities if they don't see that something is going to get better. So, so in order to, to instill hope, you've got to stimulate, you've got to, you've got to support, you've got to put a foundation under uh, people in need. And that I, I could see um, some of my counterparts um, or some of the people that we did assist um, go on to great things. You know, I mean, some of the leaders, very senior leaders in that country were people um, that I was working with um, who required assistance back in the day. You know, they became captains of industry, they became politicians, they became heads of ministries uh, or, you know, the, the government departments. And this, this was a huge, um, had a big effect on me, um, you know, not on a daily basis, but when you think, when I could continue to think about it, I would think, wow, those guys were, were just, um, you know, uh, out in the field, maybe had a few cattle, um, and look at them now. So yeah. um, the, the, the learnings have to do with understanding um, that these are human beings, right? They have, a, many of them have a great deal of, of raw intelligence, but they need that, that support that they need to be uh, uh, assisted and stood up and yeah. put in, in the right positions to, right. Um, to grow. And, and so, you know, when I came back to the D.C., um, where was I going to go that I could continue this work? You know, um, and uh, I had been a sponsor of DFs or OPIC's programs. In other words, I came to OPIC for financing as a member of the investment community in southern Africa. So we did, uh, we did okay. projects where I was coming from the other side and we raised money for uh, we did a, a large brick making project right we did some uh, uh, eco tourism um, a whole host of uh, various kinds of investments that i i was either the investor but mostly i represented investors right and looking for looking for investment so i got to know opic i got to understand this un you know rather involved uh, process that you know very well yeah. to, to, to finish or close a deal. And at some point uh, they asked me, you know, I told them it was time for me to, to do something else, to come back to the States. Uh, my family was growing and I didn't really want to, I wanted to send them to school here and yeah. they recruited me and I, 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 I ended up here and it wasn't exactly Assad. OPIC wasn't exactly what I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was a, a real development bank, right? Back in 1995, like I had been working at in Botswana. But it really, it turned out in the beginning that it was more of a U.S. support agency for American investors overseas. Yeah. And instead of, you know, throwing up my hands and, and saying, oh, well, I'm going to go do something else. Maybe I'll go to USAID. The type of work that we were doing was perfect for me. Um, but the, the goals of the agency weren't uh, uh, quite aligned with what I like. So, so we just got together with those folks that, um, you know, people, people that are, were around me at the time who were like-minded and we just pushed the envelope, right? Yeah, right, right. When, when we started back in the 90s, we wouldn't touch health. We wouldn't touch agri. We wouldn't touch education. We wouldn't touch working with uh, NGOs or not-for-profits. Uh, we had extremely stringent rules about uh, what kind of uh, loans we would make and what kind of uh, po uh, policies and procedures that were um, just not uh, uh, viable for most small businesses and even even the larger ones. We had outrageous legal policies 
I know some of them are maybe still around, but um, they were much worse. So yeah. I, I will count as, as a personal success um, knocking down these barriers over decades, right? And now we're, you know, not only are we doing these things, but they're priorities. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm quite happy about that. So it's a tremendous career over 30 years. I'm sure you've been involved in hundreds of projects. What would you count as your most successful uh, uh, development effort? Besides you pushing the envelope and getting things done in areas, uh, you know, it's well, kind of surprising, uh, Jim, that your father was in healthcare. Yeah, now I ended up there. <laughs> you know, I, I think as a, as a senior guy, you're back in healthcare. I was just um, commenting to a friend of mine that uh, who works for me in the health side that this is very ironic. Not only was my father, but my mother was a doctor, uh, yeah. a pathologist, and a yeah. very esoteric. She worked on the Manhattan Project, actually. Wow. And um, my brother's a, a dentist, still is yeah. up in Massachusetts. And my sister's a psychiatrist. Right. Um, so I was the only one. But now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the projects that I'm really proud of um, are some of the more recent ones are the COVID response projects, uh, the uh, vaccine manufacturer in India, um, where um, I think we did, it was $50 million, which isn't a tiny amount. And that was done within about three months, which is unheard of in this world, as you yeah. know. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and we did. Uh, we're we're working with the um, the uh, Senegal uh, Institute de Pasteur, de Senegal Institute Pasteur de Senegal uh, for a uh, that's a low income country, of course, and um, they have. Uh, we are making. We've already done some technical assistance with them for vaccines, and we also did another one in South Africa. So that's the more recent ones, uh, which showed our ability when everybody's aligned to yeah. really focus. And yeah. you know, one of the things you have to do in this job is to, is to work with all the other folks that are not in your group that you don't have control over to get people aligned. Um, and yeah. uh, so that was very, very interesting. Yeah. And, very, and it worked out quite well. And it affected so many lives. You know, what yes. you did in terms of a think of, you know, short three month time, maybe, maybe you know, yeah. so like, like you said, I think you've made some very important points that, you know, I think it's the uh, the efficiency and the and the alignment of goal and the urgency of the need. Right. I mean, that was partly that prompted it. Right. And I would argue that the world, you know, if you think about Bombay have a 50 centigrade, that's like 120 30, 125 degree Fahrenheit. I mean, it's just, a, you know, it's just crazy. I mean, I can't yeah. imagine what that's like, that the sense uh, of urgency should increase for us. Um, urgency and, you know, there's, a, there's this word that I don't like using a lot, but it's risk. You know, what is, what is our perception of risk? There is a, um, a standard economic attitude that, you that a high, that developing world uh, investments in risky countries should should make a bigger return and that they that but, but they're automatically risky just because it's micro just because it's SMEs yeah. it's automatically riskier. This we have done now with this particular group seven investments seven funds and we haven't lost a dime. Every single one is paid, every interest payment and every principal payment. Yes, we haven't we haven't earned a lot of extra cash because of the low return, but the low return uh, or the high, whatever return we have doesn't necessarily uh, correspond directly with risk, which goes against you know everybody on Wall Street. I am of the firm belief that we're on this earth to create impact. Try to be self-sustaining in most cases, certainly as a portfolio, right? Yeah. Pay the bills, keep the lights on. Um, but uh, let's not be looking to uh, maximize our returns. Let's look to maximize our impact 
um, work towards the goals of the Build Act, which created the FC. And some of our colleagues in the uh, developing world uh, finance side, they are regulated by, um, by you know, private uh, or, or public uh, bank, public SEC type institutions. Um, and they have to achieve certain return levels. We don't, we have the, the one advantage we have is we don't have to do that, right? Yeah. We're not publicly le- regulated in that regard. So my view yes. is um, we should use the, the funds and the spirit of the, the Build Act and the annual appropriations in order to maximize our impact and do everything we can mm. to to make these investments efficient, which is something else I've been trying to do. I know this is uh, probably the biggest problem that we have, right? Is to try and help these folks that need it um, so that they can return to us. It's not just, it's not just uh, the USG doling out funds for the, for the uh, poor people. Right. Mm-hmm. That's just not what it's about. The, the better off that the developing world uh, livelihoods for people are, the better off we are for 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 the world economy and for security. Yeah. Uh, right. and also, you said so much, Jim. You yeah. said so many things that are so critically important in such a short period of time. To me, that shows your genuine thought around development. Right. The yeah. biggest issue of risk you addressed in a very beautiful way. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's a it's a constant struggle. It's something I try to work with my people on. You know, talk about what do you get up in the morning and come to work for? You know, and yeah. we hire. At least my philosophy on hiring is, frankly, I'm looking for missionaries. Right? <laughs> You're not coming to work for the USG because you're looking to maximize your income. That, that's just crazy. So, and I hope that we're not hiring people that just desperately need jobs. So what we tend to find, or we have in the last say 10 or 15 years, we find a lot of people that are maybe mid-career, late career, or early career, but their primary goal is to, to move forward the mission, right? Yeah. And yeah. Then, you, then you gotta ask yourself what the mission is. And the culture of the agency has to constantly, in my view, be reminded and be inculcated with what the mission is constantly. And um, sometimes that's done better in some years, and sometimes it's done not as not as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, with if you have missionaries, if you have a corporation or an agency that is. Um, fighting for its mission and and solely focused on that you'll have successes but we can do you know with what we have i think we you know frankly we can do a lot more we should be doing a lot more we should be thinking about how to make it easier for those that want access to our assistance right i mean i think the uh you know one of the perpetual uh issue in the industry right is that I mean, you know, the risk taking has to increase in terms of, you know, affecting change that you are talking about. You know, your your view is much, much broader in terms of development uh, and thinking of it as almost a mission to change the life for the better, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. clearly you, you uh, own that. Uh, but as an institution, right? I mean, as development banks, um, how do you, you know, I'm sure that, that, you know, there are many voices and lots of boundaries, uh, but how do you sort of uh, really uh, take that increased risk and to bring in the private capital, because ultimately the scale would have to come from the private side, right? And um, so speak to us about you know you talked you, you said i want to talk about risk and that was i think was a very important thing and then you defined it in a very good way that you know without risk taking and if you even take that risk your performance with the global partnership uh, you know and yeah. i think it's similar with other fund managers yeah. it's been uh, 
Quite less good. than what uh, what the general markets would be. So yeah. how, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, you know what can we do to sort of redirect our focus on the mission and to accept some of the risk prudently, uh, not you know not uh, anything goes, but prudently. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's various you know big categories of risks without getting into the the weeds, but you know. As far as credit risk or financial risk goes, there's where I think we can lean in. I'm not a big proponent of taking very serious reputational risk, only because that's just going to come back and, 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 and ruin your ability to do more. We, we don't want to be on the front page of the Washington Post, right? Yeah. So we look at our counterparties very closely, and uh, we have a know your customer uh like every other bank. But um, in terms of having said that and having analyzed the, our, our position, potential position in a project, we got to make sure that we mobilize private capital, as you pointed out, which is part of our build act. It's written there. And in order to do that, um, we have to set an example because the private sector, by definition, should be, and usually is, far more risk averse than we should be. Now, I use the word should, because it's not always that way. Yeah. You know, these pure entrepreneurs are, are sometimes big risk takers, but often they're really not, because they understand their business. <laughs> they, they don't see what yeah. others see. So um, we should be really encouraging SMEs, and um, and entrepreneurs to bring their businesses here. We should do more technical assistance to help them develop plans that are so-called bankable that can get can be put in a file and can and can withstand scrutiny later on. Why did you make this decision, DFC? Well, here it is. Here's the backup. But we should we should encourage and stimulate that. We do work with banks to uh, and funds because we can't get to the smallest folks. But we 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 should do more with these funds and banks to push them to get to the to get to the people that we need to reach most, and not just say you know you'll see many many press releases that uh, so and so financial institution or DFI. Has let has has made a hundred million dollar line of credit to Citibank or to HFDC or S, whatever bank out there, and theoretically, those banks are supposed to take that money and lend it to where they haven't and they wouldn't do otherwise. So it takes. I think it, we should be questioning whether or not that's happening to the extent we say it is, and they're not just improving their own risk profiles, or we make guarantees, right? We have a big guarantee program. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to guarantee portfolios, it better be, in my view, that those portfolio investments that these banks are making are to uh, up companies and individuals and small businesses that they otherwise wouldn't make. Mm -hmm. We need to be more forward leaning and just really have people on the ground to ensure that's happening. <laughs> because the banks, uh, private banks, generally are not thinking so much about livelihoods. And uh, mm. the bottom line to me is that every single thing we do, we should think about the, the person on the ground. You know, yeah. what, what's happening in that person's life, those people's lives, that business's life, which are only people, yeah. um, as a result of our intervention. And uh, so I would like to be more forward leaning on these kinds of things, guarantees and loans to financial institutions. As an intermediary, I, I enjoy um, seeing, uh, going out to the remote areas or rural areas yes. and seeing, look, here's what I had before. I had a dirt floor before in my, yeah. now I have concrete, you know, I had, I had uh, tin roof. Now I have, uh, you know, uh, tiled roof. I had, I had three pots. Now I have six. I had two towels. Now I have eight. That kind of thing. That's yeah. how. That's how specific we get. 
And, um, and then, it, you know, that's just one example. It grows, uh, you know, like, as I said, some of these people become captains of in industry. But, you know, the thing is, unfortunately, um, the big ticket numbers get the most press, right? Um, you'll see yeah. oh, there's a big uh, port being built. In the Wall Street Journal today, there's a big article about a Chinese port in South, South America. Um, there are huge press releases about hundreds of millions of dollars to this, that, and the other thing. I don't know exactly why journalists and those of us in this business aren't better able, and that, this is what you're doing now, I assume, to get the word out that you know, there's a there's a really significant amount of people around that are trying to invest medium size amounts of money, smaller amounts of money to do what's right, to 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 do uh, investment for. Uh, and here are the results. I think it would make a really beautiful story for the Wall Street Journal to show these these folks in their better, you know, their livelihoods being improved. It's rare that you see that, you know. You'll see somebody turning the, the cutting the ribbon for an airport somewhere, which is great. You know, we need airports. We need all the infrastructure, and that's what gets all the press. Um, but yeah. uh, you know, somebody who's now who was um, making money now selling flowers uh, in a proper shop along the side of the road, yeah, yeah. or not feed her kids. You know, yeah. that that doesn't show up. So I, I think the uh, vision you present, right, of really changing, but ultimately we have to, you know, have these people in country change, right? Because they, you know, you, you, with all the good intention and all the good people like you, you know, can't make the scale of change to, right. it has to be owned by them. In my mind, the best way to, you know, uh, although, you know, our democracy right now, it, it, you know, is it, it's a bit, you know, I would say, you know, it's controversial. Yeah. It's, it's difficult times for America. But I still believe that democracy is the path. It's the best option we have. And I would love to hear your points as to how, you know, democracy is important for development. And how do you see that point of view and the, you know, sort of initiating and helping democracies come into being? Well, yeah, that's a really great point. Um, democracy, in my view, brings, brings transparency. And transparency is, to me, the key. I mean, if you had theoretically a dictatorship, but everything was completely open, and every, there was every rule and regulation published, and it was the same for everybody, and there was little or no corruption. You know, this is a huge ifs. Then fine. <laughs> it, but, but that doesn't happen. So why do you need democracy? Because you, you, it brings transparency. You've got to know the rules of the game. If you want investment, both internal and external, people have to understand what the rules are, what 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 you're likely to expect. And, and that comes back to risk. What are the risks I'm going to take if I'm an investor, uh, both inside a country and outside to help people? If I, if, if I think I have to make a payment, an, 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 an unkosher payment, or if I can't see written down exactly how I get my permit, how I get my work permits, how I get my licenses, how I get my land, how I get my power and water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... This is the part of right. where I feel so strongly that when we when we promote investment um, and people talk about um, well you know they, we get asked a lot because we're supposedly experts in country risk you know what's what's the risk I'm taking by going to Ethiopia as to what's the risk I'm taking about going to Ecuador. And it boils down to transparency, which comes back to democracy. Um, and, you know, we're a little bit um, constrained about what we can say to governments, because that's really the State Department's job. Mm -hmm. I don't think they, they kind of like us telling governments how to operate. But we do say that when they ask us, and they do all the time when we go visit and they come to, to Washington, we need more investment by DFC and others in our country. 
and we will respond. Yeah, but you know, you gotta you gotta uh, untangle the red tape, and yeah. even if you don't untangle it too much, you have to at least explain what it is. Yeah, very clearly, and you have to have a judicial system which goes with uh, democracy that will allow uh, financial institutions and others to um, to query and to 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 sue. Frankly, you know, it sounds negative, but if you have it there, it gives confidence. Again, confidence is part of democracy too. Because you can you can reckon that a real democracy you're going to have no one's going to no one questions making investment in in the states or the UK or Western Europe or Scandinavia. Yeah, you know, but uh, unfortunately, many of the developing countries are beset by pre, uh, you know, prejudicial information they get by the press and others that. Yeah. The, 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 nothing's going to be kosher or straightforward. Yeah. And that's not true in many countries that are yeah. democracies. But there's still a lot more work to do um, yeah. here. And you know, my view would be that we should be more outspoken about it. But again, that's that's yeah. just, that's just from my little seat here. Yeah. This, this is above my pay grade. Yeah. No. No. I appreciate that, and uh, I really appreciate the point about transparency and the importance and that's why SEMA is you know is a completely transparent company because a lot of good comes out of transparency it's a more difficult path but I think the idea that you know if the people themselves in Pakistan don't want to change or in Zambia or Kenya and you don't empower them through democracy really it's what happens then you have a you can't have development because it's the elite that sort of govern and they become, you know, sort of, uh, I was in an interview uh, with a bank uh, and the guy kept saying that, you know, these countries are so corrupt and so corrupt. And I finally said, yes, but who's, where are they putting their money? You know, yeah. where do they send their money from corruption? You know, they're sending it. So you're part of the corruption until you block that ideas. Uh, but, you know, money speaks a lot louder. And I think the idea of bringing, like the corruption, you know, anti-bribery act that we have in the U.S. That's right. a very positive, it's like the community reinvestment act we have. In right. Pakistan, you know, we went, uh, you know, because we have a housing company, uh, you know, we went in the poor neighborhoods. There were five bank branches, all taking deposits and mm -hmm. none lending. So the, the CRA, I don't know, uh, Jim, if you know, yeah. the community, the Genesis of that was because there was discrimination and mortgage in the red line areas, right? Yeah. So that element of empowerment right. is, is fundamentally important because we, we don't have enough resources. Uh, how do you think that can be achieved through the work we are doing? Is it more funding of uh, locally based fund managers? How do you think about the empowerment of the people that we are trying to help? Yeah, I think, you know, the, it has to be that that kind of thing has to be done through the intermediaries, through fund managers, through, as I said earlier, not just the, uh, you know, not, not the black rocks of this world or the other. They, they, there's plenty of money for them and what they're doing. And some of them have um, very laudable developing world investments, but usually their, you know, their ticket size is for one investment is 10 to 50 million and we're not talking about that, or I'm not thinking about that right now. Um, yeah, we do some large healthcare deals, um, but many of our projects are for smallholder farmers, right? That kind of thing. And we can't go to uh, Rwanda and meet farmers that, that are having, you know, a few acres or a few hectares of land and, and work with them directly. We work with the one acres of this world. We work yeah. with the root capitals and and others that are in, in the NGO business. And as I said before, that's only in the last decade or so because we wouldn't touch NGOs. Um, so uh, we, we, should, we should be far more open to, and, and you know, I, I, I think DFC has a lot to learn here too. Our own investment in funds, um, we are very concerned about the impact we're also very concerned about not losing any money. And most of them don't, uh, we do have a catalytic um, uh, carve out now, 
Yeah. And I frankly think that the catalytic side should be bigger, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they, and, and that, of course, that word is associated with risk again. <laughs> But it's not necessarily the case. And I don't think we have given ourselves enough leeway to test, at least. Let's yeah. have a, you know, and we do have a program here at DFC called the Portfolio for Impact and Invest, sorry, Portfolio for Impact and Innovation. When we started under Elizabeth Littlefield's uh, regime here, um, yeah. it was a very controversial thing. And uh, it was 10 million and under for many of these small funds, et cetera. Uh, and it was extremely uh, deemed to be very risky and very out there. And we just had a study done by Dahlberg, an independent consulting firm, after you know over well over 10 years of, of making these investments. And we have made money out of it and we've created enormous impact by this pilot yeah. program that's now permanent. Yeah. Uh, How do we, I mean, it's, you know, such good uh, thoughts, such good results. How do we communicate that to the private sector? How do we bring that knowledge, Jim? That's a great uh, question. We've been fighting our lawyers um, to get them to allow us to pub publicize this information, right? And, and there is on our website, it's pretty well hidden, um, uh, some, some information about it, but uh, my counterpart, who's our VP for policy, and I are trying to get us to, I don't know what legal restrictions there are on this stuff, but to, 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 to write stories constantly and to get out there with our success stories. And that, that the, the concept of risk in small and, and businesses and micro has got to be re-looked re at via the facts. This is, I'm, I'm not just talking off the top of my head. You know, we have uh, absolute evidence that if you do this right and um, you, you work with the right people who are in the same culture, the same missionary culture, who have the financial skills to deploy these funds, um, you know, go forth and multiply because we have done it. We've done, uh, must be um, close to a billion dollars in this, under this portfolio. Quality and innovation program. Yeah, the portfolio for uh, 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 Pi Squared, we call it, innovation um, uh, program. And it's, a, it's, it's where we cut the red tape, right? You can, you can borrow up to 10 million. You don't have to have profits. You don't have to have a track record. You do have to have some growing revenues and a good sponsor group because ultimately we're underwriting the people involved behind it, right? It's all about- I was a beneficiary of that. I think so. I yeah, think right. That. Yeah. So, and then it takes much, much less time. Yeah, yeah, right. I think that idea in terms of reducing the, you know, empowerment of uh, individuals, right? Uh, because they're great individuals that work for, uh, you know, I mean, I know a lot of development bankers and, yeah. you know, there are a lot of them are like you and they're, you know, like Lauren and Richard, who I know well, very development focused uh, at smart people. But how do you empower them that you're not sort of, you know, straight jacket into not doing the things that you believe are good, you know, in terms of empowerment, in terms of risk taking in terms of, you know, and that creation of efficiency, right? Uh, uh, at a government level, I guess, I'm not sure if you'll ever get there, but how, you know, how do you think about these issues? Well, as I said earlier, um, to start with, I'm looking for missionaries to begin with. Yeah, yeah. How do I empower them? That's a different answer. That's a different question. And what I do is, is is um, tell them that I'm, uh, I communicate to them in various ways, that I'm gonna be hands off, I want you to go for it. And here's what we do here at DFC. They understand that, that's why they're here. So you, you, don't come, you don't have to come back to me every five minutes and go to credit people and go to the lawyers and say, can we do this or that? You feel it's right, you understand, you go for it and I will, break down the front office 
or the credit people or the legal. Leave that to me. Yeah. You yeah. go do your underwriting job. Yeah. You write a nice paper and you yeah. outline and be transparent again about what you perceive or what others might perceive to be the risks in the, and that we're going to accept these and take them because yeah. of the potential results. And to leave them with not a concern that they're going to have to get involved in acrimony or, uh, you know, difficult encounters with other parts of the agency. Yeah. That's why, you know, I'm, you know, I say to my wife when I get home from work, um, you know, it's just another day of fights. But that's <laughs> what I enjoy. You know, <laughs> you've got to break these barriers. And, and, yeah. and we've, uh, we've come uh, so that's far. That's a struggle. It's yeah. a struggle. So, so Jim, I think really, I think what you have said, there's so much weight to it and so much thought to it. Uh, but I would love for you to, you know, advise or think about what, how would you advise younger people that are looking to be uh, in impact investing? How, what would your advice be for the future leaders of impact investing? Well, I get this a lot. Um, you know, I work with interns here and, yeah. um, People are asking me advice on, you know, how to get into this world. And my first piece of advice, which isn't the easiest to figure out, but you, you got to push, you got to be, is to get yourself into these uh, places um, and try and spend some six serious time in, in the developing world, right? Um, that's not a requirement, but it would, it's a huge help. If, yeah. If, if, or, or at least, um, you know, ha get some experience in the, in the financial world so that you understand um, what you're seeing and maybe you get frustrated working for Chase Bank or working for mm -hmm. JP Morgan, you know, because you don't feel that you're being fulfilled. Good. Get that, get that, get that experience and get that feeling and then come back here. Or other fight or other development institutions, NGOs or uh, DFCs of this world, and you'll know why you're here, right? You're out. You have been out there, or you've been to a, a place that does lending or an investing that doesn't satisfy you. Um, if it does, good. Many of my very close college buddies are retired already from Wall Street with a ton of money. That's yeah. great, but yeah. they didn't, they didn't they weren't fulfilled. <laughs> you know that's what they wanted so that's what they got yeah. but so oh, I, I would advise young people to take whatever classes and whatever experience they can get I, and when i was in uh connecticut college in um new london connecticut i spent a lot of time in with programs in in the relatively poor town of new london right and i was a big brother there and i had you know this young boy who was rel relatively impo impoverished and you learn a lot about people's lives doing that. Do yeah. all that kind of thing. And if it turns you on and this is something that you feel fulfilled by, and I think a lot of people do, but you have to have that experience. You know, if you grow up in a mansion and you never, you never come across this, it's going to be tough, but, uh, yeah. Get 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 to the developing area. Get, get your feet back. wet and get, yeah. get, gather whatever experience you can get and get your step, foot in the door and exactly. develop from there. Great. Uh, I I really appreciate your thoughts, uh, Jim. Uh, I think we're coming to an hour point here, but I can talk to you for a long time. Um, and uh, I think your wisdom uh, there's a lot to be taken away from your interview. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, we wish there are a lot more people that think and have the mission uh, that you have, Jim. Uh, and uh, thank you. I think we should uh, do some book around the success of development. I think it's very important to change the mindset in the private sector about the risks. You know, and if you don't take those risks, you know, you are seeing the situation in the world. Um, so I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, and I think when you talk about animal rights, I think that really goes to people that are that are much more, uh, you, you know, they're wholesome in their view because they see the, 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 the beauty of life in everything, in every living being. And when you start to talk about animal rights, I think you're at a higher plane even than just uh, human rights. 
But thank you so much. And it was a pleasure. And I wish you have a great weekend.